Hey folks, this is Steve Bradley coming to you from wonderful Payson, Arizona, and this is our teaching on Matthew chapter 20 having to do with crucifixion and service. So let's get to it. Here is the text. It says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, uh, What do you want? What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority on them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave." Um, <clears throat> I lost my place here. Let him be your slave, and just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord! son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them, and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately they received sight, and they followed him. So Jesus announces that he's planning on his own death and resurrection. And it's interesting that even after he was crucified and rose from the dead, the disciples didn't really get it at first. And they don't understand or accept it so very much that the next event is the mother of Zebedee's children, that's the mother of James and John, she was named Salome, came and asked the following favor. And so it says, Jesus says to her, what do you want? She says to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. So Jesus is saying something like this, I'm going to die in 10 days. And then the mom says, well, then moving on to the next topic, what are you going to do for my kids? That's weird. And the irony is just absolutely stunning. Jesus announces he's about to die, and mom and the boys want to know if they can get a special place at the table in his kingdom. Now, <clears throat> this is so tone deaf, I can't believe it. And I know I'm intentionally exaggerating this because even though it was one of those events that make you say, huh, what? It also illustrates the fact that the disciples really did believe in Jesus, did believe what he said, 
did believe that his kingdom was coming, but really did not see his death and resurrection as the only path to that kingdom. So this occasions the next lesson, and that's one of his most important. Greatness in his kingdom is measured by service. So here it is. When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the brothers. And so Jesus calls them over and he gives them the following statement. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it not, shall not be so among you, <clears throat> but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. And then he goes back to his coming death, and he says, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The first thing that is said about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and what he will do is that he would save his people from their sins. And this is how he has to give his life. This business of service is one of those things that almost every disciple gets wrong because it's so foreign to the way our world works. And so each of us must work on this and often work on it every single day. Even Jesus' disciples didn't really get it despite the fact that they had followed him for the three and a half years that they had been with him. But the world they knew was structured around the greatest, exercising power and authority over the least. That's just the way the world is. So this makes Jesus' admonition one of the toughest to follow because our natural response is to take advantage of those whom we believe are less. Had an interesting event occur to me um, back when uh, my dad employed a gal to clean his house and do some things for him when he was so debilitated he couldn't do anything himself. Anyway, she said she was surprised that we, that is our family, my dad and me and so on, we treated her like a real person. And of course this was a this was a Hispanic gal, a Mexican gal that we hired on a per day basis. And it shocked me. But that's the way the world is. So many times we see people as less because we're of a different color, a different size, a different intelligence, whatever it is, we see them as less. And what happens then is we stop treating them like people. Well, Jesus never did that. And he commanded that we never do that. Jesus commands us to counteract this lack of desire to serve with purpose and make it our aim and effort to serve. So he says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And once again, he brings up his death. The final clause brings up what is actually on his mind as he goes to his death in about 10 days. His purpose is about to be fulfilled. Billy Graham once said of Jesus that Jesus was born to die, meaning that Jesus' death was central to God's purpose. His purpose would not have been fulfilled had he not died on the cross. So the Bible actually makes it quite clear, probably clearer than you realize, that the purpose in Jesus' death was to die for us. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, When we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He gave himself up to death on the cross in Philippians 2, 8. And that death purchased our redemption because he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. First <clears throat> uh, John chapter 2, verse 2 says that. God has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Imagine that. He had no sin in his life. He was not even acquainted with it but he became sin for you and me. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made us, his right, uh, made him our righteousness, and he made us righteous because of him. So Jesus Christ, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This was always the Father's plan. It was always Jesus' plan. It was always what he wanted and intended to do. And so in John chapter 11, he says, He that lives in me, lives and believes in me, shall never die. <clears throat> now Jesus actually demonstrates what he meant when he said, I intend to give my life for my people, I am a servant. I want to be a servant. The Son of Man came to serve. And so he demonstrates that as he went out of Jericho. Remember, they've been talking about his death. They've been talking about the end of his life. And usually, when you talk about the end of someone's life, that's pretty much all they can think of. But what Jesus said was, Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. The multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them, and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion. He felt for them, and he touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. In other words, Jesus felt for these people, despite the fact that the subject of the moment was his death. So Jesus was able to put aside his own thoughts, fears, issues with him going to the cross and serve those two men because he was the true servant of the Lord. Now, of course, I don't mean it was easy. We will see how hard it was for him to do that when we get to the night of his arrest and his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. His human suffering, folks, was indescribable. His spiritual suffering as we see in Psalm 22, was infinite. And he did this for you and me, sinners undeserving of the least of his mercies. Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15, summarizes it this way, and there is a later explanation in Isaiah 53, which also follows. Uh, the prophet says, Behold my servant, and of course he's, this, this is a thus saith the Lord thing, so behold, my servant, the Father is saying, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. 
but the path to him being exalted, extolled, and becoming very high is his suffering and death. And so the prophet continues, just as many were astonished at you, his visage was marred more than any man. You couldn't even see he had a face. And his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. And of course this talks about the sprinkling of the blood, which the Bible discusses many times as the effective cause of our redemption and our forgiveness of sins. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. They'll stop talking. They will cease to think of themselves as important people. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. And <clears throat> I'm going to read Isaiah 53 and make a few comments on it as we go. I may lose my voice here because I have a hard time reading this without being overcome. Isaiah 53 is one of the greatest and most important prophecies in the Old Testament. It was written hundreds of years before Jesus died, yet it details many of the, event, of the events that uh, involved his death, led up to it, and resulted from it. So here it is. <clears throat> Isaiah starts, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, that is Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. The dry ground, of course, was the nation of Israel, which had for so long forsaken the Lord. He has no form or comeliness. It doesn't mean he wasn't a good-looking man. It was just he wasn't impressive. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Once again, he's not uh, someone that we would elect as president. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And that sorrow and that grief came from his bearing our iniquities. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. The Jewish nation, for the most part, rejected him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. On the other hand, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But it was for our transgressions he was wounded. So the contrast is we looked at him and we thought, man, this guy, God is against him because he's being crucified, he's being killed. But the truth was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement which brought about our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Quoted, by the way, in 1 Peter chapter 2. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. But the Lord didn't let us go. He didn't say, you can have whatever you want in life. What he said is, I'm going to send my son to die for you. So the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't complain. He was taken from prison and from judgment <clears throat> the night of his arrest. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He's 33 years old and died before his time. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. They made his grave with the wicked. <clears throat> 
he was crucified between two thieves. But with the rich at his death, Joseph of Arimathea gave his tomb to Jesus. And that tomb was the tomb of a wealthy man who could afford to have his his sepulcher, his tomb, carved out of rock. He was entombed with the rich as at his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. In other words, he was murdered as a criminal. But Joseph of Arimathea and his disciples thought he was worthy of the burial of a king. He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now listen to this carefully. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, is how the New King James has it. Other versions have it. It pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. This was God's doing. When you, now there's a third person here, and that's you, make his soul an offering for sin. So here is the thing, and this is a little bit unclear from the passage, but what it means is you have to choose. You have to decide that it was you he died for. Now, I don't mean that he didn't die for you, but the point is it's have no effect to you unless you choose it. When you make a soul an offering for sin, he, that is the Son and the Father, shall see his seed, that would be you. He shall prolong his days after the resurrection, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the anguish of his soul and be satisfied with the punishment visited upon the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins. By his knowledge, my righteous servant, says the Father, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Forgive them, Father, said Jesus on the cross, for they know not what they do. Such an amazing prophecy and in so many ways just ties into every event around his death in the New Testament. Powerful, beautiful, scary. I mean, when the Bible talks about prophecy, it means that God predicted the future before it happened because he's God. And the, the, there is no actual time to him. It's like he's standing over a parade. It's like he's flying over a parade, I should say, and he can see all the events. He can see you and whether or not you decided that it was time for you to turn to the Lord today. And you should. You really should. When you make his soul an offering for sin, you make his soul an offering for sin. God will bless you for that forever. And you will have eternal life. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off.